that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Our topic today is the love story, an introduction. You may be seated. We have, I'm going to ask, thank you, just pass those on out. We have uh, the notes that we would like to uh, pass out for you, those of you that need something to write on. Uh, you're going to need to take uh, some very close and careful notes today. And um, we tried to make it as convenient as possible uh, by making sure that you have the, uh, the note sheets there to write on. We're looking at the love story. I love a love story. I, I, I guess I'm kind of mushy when it comes to love stories. I was uh, watching... Um, Little House on the Prairie the other day. No, the Waltons. I was watching the Waltons. And uh, on, on that show, one of the uh, uh, characters was an elderly gentleman. And he had a wife, and they had lived together for over 40-something years and had been married, you know, for 40-something years, had a beautiful marriage. And uh, as time would have it, uh, the wife died. And he had a very difficult time accepting the fact that his wife had died. And uh, he would often find himself going to the places they used to go to and visit and, and going to uh, different things and events that they used to go to uh, because it reminded her of, her, of him of her. But uh, he also be, just had a tendency to think that she was still with him uh, even though she was deceased. And as I was sitting there uh, watching that show, it reminded me of myself and Pastor Arnett because we spend so much time together. And it seems like when you see one, you see the other. And uh, I, I just began to wonder, should the Lord allow one of us to go to sleep? Uh, how would that affect the one that was left? And uh, my I actually, tears just began to... Uh, kind of uh, bubble up in my eyes as I thought about the possibility of us being separated by death. And, and you know something, uh, when you love somebody, you just want to be with them. You want to be with them. One test of true love, Sister Burden, is whether you want to be with that person or not. I know sometimes we stand in front of the altar and uh, we say, until death do us part, I'm going to love you, I'm going to uh, sugarcoat you, I'm going to uh, hold you and cherish you and all of that. But when it comes down to it, do we really want to be with that person when the, the 5 and the 10 and the 15 and 20 and so on years roll by? I, I, I thank God that I want to be with my wife. I, I can't speak for y'all, but I want to be with my wife. And uh, I thank God that um, God has blessed us uh, to share love that uh, has transcended even uh, 2,000 miles. We're still madly in love with each other. Amen. And, and, and as we look at this uh, particular uh, introduction now to the book of uh, Revelation, last week we gave you an overview of what Revelation was about. And in this uh, message, we are going to be looking at uh, the introduction to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, and I'm going to take my time. I have a lot to share with you today. Take notes. Take notes as I go along. The book of Revelation is a picture of God, a picture of God and his love. Uh, he is our bridegroom. Uh, we are the bride, and he is rescuing us from the dragon. Amen. And it is a story, thank God, with a happy ending. It's a beautiful story with a very happy ending. So we are going to be looking at it from the book of Revelation, but we're also going to be uh, looking at other parts of the Bible as well. And eventually, we are going to even go to the book of Daniel because we know that that is the companion book to the book of Revelation. So many make a mistake because they try to read one or the other. You really must study both of them 
if you really want to get the right understanding of what God's message is in this last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And a lot of times we look at prophecy, uh, we attribute it to the Antichrist. We attribute it to the beast and to dark and gloomy pictures so often when we look at this book of prophecy. But I think it's a prophetic picture of God. And you know something, all through the Bible, we have to look for God throughout his word. And more importantly, we need to look for Jesus throughout the Bible, all the way from Genesis down to Revelation. Jesus is the central figure of the Bible. That means that Jesus is the central figure of the book of Revelation. And I think that one of the things that we must emphasize is Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. And you're going to hear me refer back to this particular passage of Scripture time and time again. Where the Bible says, blessed is he that read it and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written there for the time is at hand. There is a threefold blessing in the book of Revelation, as I told you on last week. And the reason why God has put a threefold blessing in the book of Revelation is to encourage us to read this book, to hear this book, and to keep what this book says. Let me say that again. The reason God put a threefold blessing on this book it is to encourage us to read this book, to hear this book, and to obey what this book says. Why would we need to be encouraged to read and keep and hear the book of Revelation? Why is that? Why would God have to bait us in order to get us to read this book? Possibly in God's understanding a danger that people would be uninterested, disinterested, or just don't care about this book called Revelation would exist. They would perhaps even be afraid of the book of Revelation. It's interesting that one of the reasons why many Christians avoid the book of Revelation is because they believe that the book of Revelation is really for the future that they don't have to worry about what it contains because it does not pertain to us. They feel like this is something that's going to take place long after we have been here and gone, and therefore we don't have to worry about it. But I want you to know, this book was written for us. As you look at all of the unfolding of things that are happening all around us, this book is pointing to the day and time that we are living in. Wars and rumors of wars. Men are, are, are being lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Men are more concerned with the fun and frolic of the world rather than the word of God and what it brings to our lives. That's where we are in our days and time. Morality at an all-time low. Murder at an all-time high. All of these things are taking place right here before our very eyes. No, this book wasn't written for some time way down the line. This book was written for us right here, right now. And that's why it's important that we open our eyes. Ask God to take the blinders off of our eyes so that we can recognize the significance of this book called Revelation and how important it is for us to study this word so that we can show ourselves approved unto God. Can I get one amen? amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The book of Revelation is not just for the future, and it doesn't have any relevance for them uh, because they are going to be gone and raptured away as some folk thinking. And they make a good point. And, and so, you know, I, I think Christ is giving us this injunction to listen. Blessed are they who read this 
and understand it. This is the one book that Satan doesn't want you to get. He really doesn't care if you read Genesis all the way down to Jude. But he discourages you from reading the book of Revelation. He discourages you from reading this book. And he does it in many ways. Uh, oftentimes when you have an opportunity to study this book in group sessions, we find something else to do. Oftentimes when you decide that you're going to read it at home by yourself, you stop reading because you come across some that you quote unquote don't understand. The devil has many ways that he tries to discourage us from reading the book of Revelation because he realizes that if you read this book, if you hear this word, if you abide by this word, that you're going to get a triple blessing. Some of us are sad and discouraged and going through all kinds of stuff because we won't read this book. We're missing out on the blessings that God has for us. It's the last book of the Bible. You know, the consummation of the Bible. And so it's like the Lord's final saying to us. And he's going to put his most important information in those final sayings. So there's a reason, I believe, that, you know, it, it, it's actually Satan behind making this book look unattractive. You don't want to read it because things might happen to you. People have been warned and told, if you read this book, some bad things are going to happen. You're going to be sorry you read this book. It's going to scare you. It's going to frighten you. It's going it's to make you even run from the Lord because you have read what the Lord said. Now that, somebody explain that to me. Now I, I, I really don't get that. But that's what a lot of people teach and believe about this book. Could it be that they have not read this book? Or when they read it, they did not get the right understanding. Because the Lord says, blessed is he that understands this book. The blessing is not only in picking it up and going word for word for word for word. But we've got to ask the Holy Ghost to help us to understand what this word means. And thank God that he reveals to us what this word means as we study this book and we ask the Holy Ghost to reveal it to us. The devil uses tactics of fear and all well, you know, I, I can't understand about or I can understand everything else, but no, I just can't understand this. It seems like some believe and, and understand everything but the book of Revelation, the one that God blessed, the one that God gave a triple blessing on. That's the way the devil wants it to be. And I think that's crucial because a failure to understand prophecy is what led the people in crisis time to reject him. Do you realize that they did not understand prophecy? That's why they rejected Christ. They didn't understand the prophecies. They, they, their misunderstanding of prophecy led them to reject him as the Messiah. Because they confused his first coming with the second coming. They were thinking that the way the Bible described his second coming would be the way that he would come the first time. Oh, you remember? You remember how they thought that he was coming as a king and that he was going to set up his throne and that he was going to overthrow the Roman government and that he was going to rule with a rod of iron. They thought that was the first coming. But no, the first coming, according to prophecy, was that he would come as a baby and that he would be stricken by the afflictions of men, and that he would wear the stripes of, uh, uh, of, of, of man, and that he would be battered and bruised for our sake. No, they, they misunderstood the prophecies. And my brothers and my sisters, we stand the same danger in these days today. If we don't understand 
the prophecies of God as he's given it to us, we will miss what God has said about his son coming again. We'll miss it. We'll miss it. We'll be just like the Hebrews were who misunderstood the prophecies. I think the same thing is so true for today. You know, a misunderstanding of Christ's second coming for his third coming is going to prepare people to receive a counterfeit Messiah. See, those same people that are still waiting for Jesus to come the first time because they didn't accept his first coming. So when he comes the second time, they are going to think that's the first time. Yeah. Do y'all get this picture? And they are not going to be prepared for when he comes. Because we know that when he comes the second time, that he's coming and he's coming with his reward in his hand. He's coming as king of kings and lord of lords, but that won't be his first time. In other words, it will be game over when he comes. But some will think that they can then begin to follow and worship Jesus Christ, but it'll be too late. Don't get it twisted. And that's why it's important that we understand the prophecies, especially the prophecies of this last book, the culmination, the consummation of the word of God. My Lord, there's no other book of the Bible where God blesses he that reads, blesses those that keep, blesses those that hear the prophecies of this book. There's no other book in the Bible that has that in it. And the word blessed is a, a really interesting word. Do you understand what it means? It, it means literally that you are to be happy. Anybody want to be happy? I see a lot of sad looking faces out here today. <laughs> Pick up the book. The Bible even says that you'll be happy. You'll come to church with a smile on your face. And I'll know it because you have been reading the book. There's a different happiness that you'll get once you pick up this book. I challenge you today, my sisters, my brothers, my little children, I challenge you today to pick up the book, Revelation, and read it. Study it and ask God to give you understanding. God says if you read, if you hear, and if you keep these words of the prophecy of this book, you will be happy. Satan says, and some scholars say, and some people say, no, you will, be, you, you will be afraid if you read this book. Satan says you will be scared if you read this book. It's a fearful book. It's a book of doom and gloom. That's what Satan paints. But I want to stand before you today and let you know that this book called Revelation is all about Jesus. And I want you to know there's no doom, there's no gloom, there's no fear in Jesus Christ. If you want to be happy, pick up the book that Jesus said will give you happiness. That's the book. Oh, what, what book is it? Revelation. Amen. Amen. Don't get it twisted. I'm talking about Revelation today. Amen. Don't get it twisted. I'm talking about the book of Revelation. And so if we know God is so loving and so kind as to show us what the future holds, you know, sometimes I, I wish that I had 20, 20 visions going backwards. I, I wish that some 20 years ago or maybe 30 years ago when, uh, when certain companies were going on the stock market that I had known today what I know now. I wish that I had known that there would be a company called Apple or there would be a company called Google. 
I had an opportunity to invest in Google. Turned it down. Didn't know that I could have been probably a millionaire by now with just a few dollars. Just a few, it, but looking backwards, it's 2020. Amen. But I thank God that with this book right here, we don't have to wish we had a. Hello, somebody. We can just open up this book and God will prepare us and help us to understand those things that are to come. He's given us a bird's eye view of what the future holds. And we don't have any excuse not to know. We don't have any excuse. You are at a church that encourages you to know, that encourages you to open this book, that encourages you to understand the word of God in this book. Some people, when they read through the Bible, they get the reading plans and they read all the way down to Jude. Then they turn around and go back to Genesis because somebody has made them afraid to study the book of Revelation. Are you really a scary cat like that? <laughs> Are you really that afraid of a little book? And so if we know God is so loving and kind and to show us what the future is, doesn't it make sense for us to allow him to open our eyes and to see what thus saith the Lord? I think that makes sense. God is telling us exactly how, it's laid, how it lays out. And he tells us once, seven churches. Then he tells us again, seven seals. Then he tells us again, seven trumpets. And he tells us again, seven salvation signs. And every time he adds another picture of these events, he gives a little bit more detail for us so that we can understand them. So this is the way that you check yourself when you're studying the book of Revelation. You know the process. We call it repeat and enlarge. Y'all need to write that down. Repeat and enlarge. That is the system of God's revelation throughout the Bible, all the way from Genesis down to Revelation. God repeats and then he enlarges. In other words, he will say something and then he'll come back and say it again, but the next time he says it, it's with more details than he gave at first. It's called repeat and enlarge. So something that is just out of the blue and, and that doesn't match what you have seen before more than likely does not fit God's divine and divine design. In fact, as we've been talking about the book of Revelation and the idea that it is a summary of the entire Bible, guess what? The entire Bible is written this way, repeat and enlarge. For example, in, in Genesis chapter 1, the, the creation story, God created man and woman in his own image. He created them, right? That's in Genesis 1. But then God comes right back in Genesis 2, and he repeats that in Genesis 2. He repeats it, and he enlarges. So how specifically did he create man and woman? Well, he created Adam from the dust of the earth. But he also created Eve from the rib in the Adam's side. You notice how at first in chapter 1, he just says he created man and woman. In chapter 1. In chapter 2, he said it gives more detail. He says, I created Adam from the dust of the earth. And then I took from Adam's side a rib from which he made uh, Eve. He gives a little bit more detail, repeats the same thing, but with more detail. That is called repeat and enlarge. You see, right from the beginning, God uses this repeat and enlarge idea. In fact, if you start with Exodus, and then you go to Leviticus, and then you go to Numbers, and then you go to Deuteronomy, and you're repeating and enlarging, you find the Ten Commandments in each one of those books. 
And in each one of those books, God gives more detail than the one before. Then if you go to Samuel, Samuel, the uh, first and second Samuel, we find repeat and enlarge is being used there. You go to first and second Kings, repeat and enlarge is being used there. Go to first and second Chronicles, and when you read through the Bible, and you're reading Chronicles, chapter by chapter, you go like, wait a minute, <laughs> I've already read that. <laughs> That's because it's being repeated over and over again. Why does God repeat things for us? Because he wants us to what? He wants us to get it. He wants us to remember it. He wants us to understand it. That's how, why when you tell your children something and you're trying to make sure that they understand, you repeat it to them. I need you, baby, to go down and pick up uh, the clothes at the laundromat. Go to the one that's uh, the third washer on the right. All right, now, if you told Justin that one time and sent him on his way, he'd probably come back with somebody else's clothes. <laughs> Amen, church. Amen. But God keeps telling us stuff over and over and over again so that he makes sure that we get it, that we understand, and that we don't come back with the wrong thing. Even in the book of Psalms, what David would do, he would start a thought in one place. And then he will continue that thought in another place. And then he will continue from there in another place. He's repeating and enlarging. This is the design of the Bible if you carefully study it. That's why. That's why we are told that there's nothing new under the sun. It's all repeat. And enlarge. And then you go through the New Testament, and what do you find? You find Matthew. He's repeating. You, you notice the first chapter in, in Matthew starts out with what? Anybody know? Remember? Starts out with genealogy. And you're reading all those names. Oh my goodness, can't pronounce most of them. But you just read them over in the Old Testament. Repeat and enlarge. Then you got Mark. Mark is probably the first gospel that, uh, that's uh, been repeated and enlarged. Luke repeats and enlarged. John does the same thing. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because in Daniel, you have Daniel chapter 2, you have Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 11. And you have four repeats and enlarged. It starts out with Nebuchadnezzar in that dream. You remember that in the golden image that he had. Then you read again over in Daniel 7, and it's, it's not that golden image now. It's not that image, but it's now beasts. And each one of these beasts give a little more description to each one of these kingdoms that was represented in Daniel chapter 2. Repeat and enlarge. Now, if you hadn't got it yet, this is the way that the Bible is designed. What do you expect the book of Revelation to be then? How do you expect it to be? Same way. Repeat and enlarge. God inspired four people to write the gospel. And we have to look at the significance of numbers in the Bible. And for a significant, a significant number in the Bible, and it is significant in the book of Revelation, four is representative of all people. It's north, south, east, and west. It, it's, the four, it's the four directions of the compass and for the four winds and this means that the number four means all included. 
everyone's included in the Gospels. So you have all these symbols, you have all these signs. And where do you find the meaning like prophetic days? Uh, you know, you've often heard us say that a day is a, uh, a, a, a prophetic day is the same as a literal year. Uh, y'all, y'all do remember that, right? And, and, and uh, like, where do you look for things like that? Well, you look for it by finding the first times in the Bible where those things are mentioned. And then you begin to continue to follow each time that that word or that number is used and it will help you to understand what the Bible really says about that symbol or that sign or that number. And sometimes the symbols are identified right there in the text. Our text today, I don't know if you caught it, uh, down in Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to get there in just a minute, uh, verse 20. But in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is pictured among the candlesticks. Now, the candlesticks, that's sanctuary language. That's sanctuary language because the first time that we find these candlesticks mentioned is in the sanctuary service. So if you really want to know what the candlesticks represent in the book of Revelation, where do you need to go? Over to the Old Testament and study to see what the candlesticks meant then in the sanctuary. Now the candlesticks, that's sanctuary language, that's sanctuary symbolism that again is borrowed from the Old Testament from the rest of the Bible all through the Old and New Testaments and Hebrews. And in Revelation, we're told what the mystery of this, the candlesticks are. It says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, and I'm quoting Revelation 1 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven church. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Sometimes the word of God will interpret what the symbol means right then, right there. But some of us don't want to dig for the times when it's not right then, right there. Sometimes God will require us to go back and dig and study and find out what it means. Could it be that we are just too complacent? We don't got too lazy that we don't want to dig. I remember when, when I was, uh, I had just gone to college. I was a freshman in college. And during those times, you know, we didn't get, uh, what do you call them now, internships. Uh, you, bet, you had to go down there and get in an employment line and, and find you a job. And so I went back home for that summer, my freshman year, finished freshman year, 4.0 uh, average, I was uh, riding the cloud. Went back home, fill out application, and uh, I got a job. I got a job. Guess what my job was with my 4.0 average? Oh no, I wish I had been bagging groceries. Digging holes for telegram poles. Digging holes for telegram poles. And baby sister, they didn't have that machinery that they have now. You see that spiral thing that they just zoop and dig that hole now? Post hole digger. Post hole digger. Had some old man out there. Some, everybody on the crew was old but me. And they would take those post hole diggers and they would I mean, they were digging them holes. I got out there. We'd be at work probably about 7 o'clock in the morning. I, my first day, I went stepping out there. Saw them old men digging that hole. They said, okay, I want you to start. They were playing a joke on me because they knew 
that I was wet behind the ears and that I wasn't going to be able to handle it. They told me to dig a hole on down by the way. I went down there. First of all, I noticed the ground didn't just break when I, I had to keep on. <coughs> and I finally got that ground to break. Then I finally got a little scoop of dirt out, about a handful like that. And I'm thinking, Lord, I got to dig a post. I got to dig a hole big enough for this post to go in. And I ain't got but a handful. I've been working 30 minutes trying to get this. I worked all day. They dug about three or four holes to my one. And those holes had to be, I believe it had to be eight feet deep. And, and about, about like that. Eight feet deep for a big telegram pole to go down in. I went home that day. I told my mama, you ain't got to worry about me dropping out of school. I get the message. And I went back the next day, same thing. I finished that week because of my pride. I wasn't going to let them old men outdo me. But at the end of that, that next week, I found me a job in the factory. <laughs> that was the worst summer of my life. Got in the factory. All the other folk had been there years and like doing stuff, you know, doing it, doing it. I'm like, I finished that summer. I said, baby, talk to my mama. I didn't say baby. I said, mama, mama, you ain't got to worry about me working no factory either. But the point is this. In order for me to achieve what I was setting out for, I had to work for it. I had to work for it. And the job that we do might be easy to some or hard to others, but you have got to have the mind to work. Many people don't understand this book of the Bible. It's because they don't want to work for the understanding. They want somebody like Pastor Owen to just feed it to us. We open our mouth and you drop it in. And then some of us won't even come to the feeding. Some uh, Y'all listen to me now. Some of us won't even come to the feeding. Then we get mad because we hadn't been fed. We'll go and tell somebody, well, you know, I ain't being fed. I think I'm going to go on to... Why weren't you fed? The, the food was on the table. It was being served up. But we've got to have a mind to receive what's being given to us. Receive what God has given us in this book called Revelation. Now, this is sometimes how the symbols are broken down. If you look in Daniel 7, for example, Daniel sees these beasts rising up out of the sea in his dream. And then in verse 17, he he's told what these uh, beasts represent. Those beasts that you saw, the Bible tells him, are kings. Each one of those beasts that he saw come up out of that, that, uh, that, uh, that sea represented a king. So Daniel was given the interpretation right then, right there on the spot. So there are times in Revelation, John is told what the, the symbol means. Uh, for instance, the waters were that woman, where that woman is sitting, are peoples. See, it, it, it connects waters with people. Waters with people and multitudes and tongues. There are times when it's right there in the context of the prophecy. But then there are other times when you have to go search for it. And so this day, for a year thing, that is definitely something that God has used back in the Old Testament in a number of different places. And you have to go and look for it if you want to understand what it means. Oh, and then you, you, you have to see, does the symbol fit? 
Let me, let me tell you about what I mean by that. You can't just take a symbol and identify it in a Bible verse and then just throw it in anywhere you want to and expect it to fit. For instance, when you read in prophecy, Christ is described as a lion. All right? Well, we wouldn't say that he is then the lion in Daniel chapter 7. Talking about two different lions. In Daniel chapter 7, that lion actually represents a kingdom, and that kingdom is Babylon. So we can't take it when it refers to Jesus as the lion of Judah and put in Babylon where it says lion. It has to fit in context. If you look at it, for example, the number three you'll see the number three. You may not realize it at first, but every time you read about the number three, you begin to see something. Oh, there's something symbolic about the number three. And the first time the number three is mentioned, it's on the third day. The first time the number three is mentioned, it's on the third day. God brought forth what on the third day? He brought forth fruit from the ground. And that means something. So the first fruits were brought forth from the ground on the third day. So the first fruits were brought forth from the ground on that day. And you began to think, oh, wait a minute. Jesus Christ, who is our first fruit was brought forth on the, from the ground on what day? Don't y'all be afraid. Talk to me. You know, on the third day. You see how this number three? See how that number three? Then you begin to take notice of every time three is mentioned. The butler and the baker. Remember Joseph? The butler and the baker. After three days, one of you is going to be loosed and the other one is going to be killed or it's going to die. Jonah was in the belly of the well for how many days? Amen. Abraham sees a place where he is to sacrifice his son three days. In three days. All these examples of the number three leads to the conclusion that three has something to do with life and death. When you take all of them into account. So when you look at different numbers or symbols, you want to be careful to look for a repetition because that's what's happening. When you see something being repeated, connected with a certain symbol or sign, take note of that repetition. So if you were to go home right now and do a study on the number three, all the three days of scripture, you would find so many of them that uh, in particular, uh, you will find that a thought of the dividing line between life and death. That is what the number three represents. The dividing line between life and death. So that would be just one example of how to find symbols, how to find signs. And when you see the pattern I'm seeing a pattern here with the number three. I'm seeing a pattern here with the number four or with the number seven. Those things are going to be crucial when you come to the book of Revelation. Now, the reason that the things you are learning here, and learning here, I'm speaking about turning point. And even when you study the word of God, don't stick it. It doesn't stick in your mind. And the reason that it doesn't is because you don't share it with anybody else. Those things that we learn and we share, we retain. Write that down because it's going to help somebody in school. The things that you learn and you share, you retain. I used to get so frustrated. Crystal be studying all these things and, and in, in medical school. 
I have no idea. She be calling all these names and using all these terms and expressions. I'm like, baby, you need to stop talking in tongues unless you have an interpreter. Because I couldn't understand what she was talking about. But what she was doing, she was learning this stuff. And then she was sharing it with us. And that helped her to retain it even better. And when you learn something out of the word of God, you need to run and tell somebody else whether they want to hear it or not. You go to them, you say, hey, look, let me tell you what I learned at church today. Let me tell you what I learned as I was studying the Bible today. And you share it with them. And when you share it with somebody else, you hold on to it in your heart better because you've shared it with somebody else. Let's take a look at the number 12, and, and I'm almost finished. Now, 12 is another symbolic number. How do we identify with that number? Well, we go back to the Old Testament again. And we realize that when God first developed his people, they were developed as 12 sons that became 12 tribes. The 12 tribes of Israel, they were God's people. And then we go to the New Testament, and we find Jesus doing the very same thing. Uh, he calls 12 apostles. And the 12 apostles become God's New Testament church, or we understand today the Christian church. So God had an Old Testament church, the 12 tribes of Israel, and God has a New Testament church, that began with the 12 apostles. Wow, 12, 12. That, that number is now connecting with God's church, God's people. The number 12 represents God's organized church or organized people on planet Earth. When you get to the end of the book of Revelation, you have the city of New Jerusalem that we are all trying our best to enter into. It has how many gates? Twelve gates. And it has twelve foundations. And the name of the twelve tribes are over the gates. And the names of the twelve apostles are on the foundation. Twelve times twelve gives you 144, which is symbolic of the 144,000 that represents God's last day people. 12 times 12. So let's connect all of this together. The book of Revelation connects all of this for us. The numbers play out and give us understanding. It gives us representation of certain aspects of truth. The three, the life and death, the 12, the kingdom of God, the four, all inclusive, going back to the four, when Jesus Christ gave a parable of the sower and the seed, he was talking about the word of God being sown in the earth, in all the earth. How many types of, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me back up. Let me see how many of you all, already forgot some. What does the number four represent? All inclusive, right? All people, the four winds of the earth, the all right, it includes, the number four represents all. He was talking about the word of God being sown in the earth, in all the earth. How many types of ground did he identify in that parable? Does anybody remember? How many different types of, say it, you got it. Oh, you can't talk, I forgot. Four. <laughs> all right, four. There were four types of ground that is identified in that parable. Not three, not five, but four. Four types of ground. Now, out of those four types of ground, how many of them were good ground? Don't want to say it. One, one. When you get to Revelation chapter six, you have the opening of the seals. In Revelation chapter 6, there are four horses. Four horses. Not five, not three. And what do we say the four represent? It, it represents all-inclusive. 
It represents north, south, east, and west, the four directions. So in Revelation 6, you have these four horses. One of them, the white horse, is considered to be good. Three of them are considered to be bad, the red one, the black one, and the pale horse. Three are bad, one of them are good. They all add up to four. Same with the ground. In fact, there's a perfect parallel between the horses and the sore. When they are the parallel, when we see that the parallel of the sore and the seed, and when we look at that as we get into Revelation 6, we see that four is symbolic of God sowing seed in all the world, of everyone being included in the seed. Twelve, God's kingdom, God's New Testament church, Old T Testament church. In the book of Revelation 7, there are four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. It symbolizes that the sealing message is not a local message, but the sealing message is a global message. So now that we begin to see the number four, when we look at the number, we say, okay, I know that number four represents worldwide. So when I see it now, I can bring into my understanding or my interpretation, this has something to do with a global, worldwide movement and message. Now somebody say, well, turning point, how do you play into this picture? You not worldwide, you just Shady Lane wide. But is that true? For when we proclaim this message by whatever way that God gives us, we are sharing it with the world. We had to discontinue our radio ministry, our internet radio ministry. But I think I shared the statistics on that ministry a couple of times and how that in a given month's time, uh, we had about, I think about 50 to 60, one, year, one month we had about 75,000 people that were listening to our radio ministry all over the world, China, Afghanistan, how they understood what we were saying, I don't know, but I do know that Holy Ghost is able, he's our interpreter, amen, but th the point is, it doesn't matter how small you are. The, the, the thing that is important is how willing you are to use what you got to share this gospel with others. And we are part of a worldwide movement. There are little turning points all over this world. I'm not talking about major orthodox denominations. I'm talking about a remnant of people that Antipas, anybody remember Antipas, the term? Y'all were here, right? Against what? Against the fathers. Against those Nicolaeans, those that were not teaching the truth of God's word and abiding by the truth of God's word. That's who we are. We are Antipas. We are the ones that stand up against what is not right. And we stand up for what is right. Might mean that we'll have to be martyred. Might mean that we might have to give up our lives. But we're still going to stand up for what is right. Antipas. And thank God that there's still Antipas among God's people. So when it, I see it now, I can bring it into understanding. And I understand that this worldwide movement uh, it's global. It's not just something local. And with what we are doing right here at Turning Point and other Bible prophecy teaching churches around the world, we are taking a message that God has blessed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We are taking it into the world because Revelation 7 and the symbolism there of four tells us that we should be doing this and even more. That's why 
We make sure that Pastor Arnett can see it out in California. That's why we make sure that Monica and her family can view. And countless others that we don't know about that see this message and hear this word. We give them an opportunity to know what thus said the Lord. And another symbol that's identified in, in relation to that is what we call the three angels message. Now we hear a lot of talk. And you're going to hear some more talk from this desk about the three angels message. And remember our theme this year is three angels, three messages, one God. But are you aware that there is a fourth angel? Oh yeah, there's a fourth angel also that is referred to in Revelation. You find that over in uh, Revelation chapter 18. And, it, and this angel lightens the earth with the glory of God. Isn't that something? It's basic, it's simple, but it's beautiful when you look at this. It's so amazing to me that it's so designed that it's not haphazard. This thing wasn't put together haphazardly. God had a divine plan, and God's hand is all the way through this thing from Genesis to Revelation, and especially in the book of Revelation. All of these things have meaning, have deeper meaning, and that you must know that we must testify of the omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing God who just knows everything there is to know and yet can break it down for us to understand. I think when we approach the book of Revelation, we need to approach it like it's a science. Science has rules, and if you don't follow those rules, then you're going to come up with a false answer. You can't just pick up the book of Revelation and not follow the rules of the Bible for understanding it. It's kind of like when you're doing mathematical computations. Uh, I was taught, and they may have changed it now with this new math, but you had to, when you're solving a, an equation, you had to solve the, the parenthesis first. You had to perform what goes on in the parenthesis first. It might be 2 times 3 or 3 plus 4, whatever's in the parenthesis. Then you move outside of the parenthesis, and you apply that to whatever you got from the parenthesis. Well, that's the way you have to follow understanding the book of Revelation. There's a method to it. And God will reveal the method to us, to us if we would just allow him to explain it to us. And then follow the directions that God gives us. As I come to my close. So there's a symbol, actually, a design that I want to share with each one of you the principle of repeat and enlarge. Look for that, re that, that uh, principle as we study this book, and we're going to be applying it as we go further. Uh, we'll see that the book of Revelation is based upon the pattern of the sanctuary. Study the sanctuary, and it will unfold for you the things that are in the book of Revelation. Study the sanctuary, and it will unfold for you the things that are contained in the book of Revelation. When we look at the sanctuary, we find that there are six articles of furniture in the sanctuary. The first was the altar of sacrifice. And then this is followed by the laver. Now the laver was used for washing or cleansing. The, the altar was used for, for sacrifice. Now, of course, we know that those point to the death of Christ. The altar of sacrifice and the laver represents baptism. And they're in the courtyard. They're on the outer part of the sanctuary. They are in the courtyard. So those two articles of furniture show how Christ came to redeem us from sin. Talk about the sanctuary now. How Christ 
came to redeem us from sin and how he forgave us and purified us. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and, and that's, found, that's Revelation 13. Absolutely, and he washes us in Revelation. And the lamb slain is the first symbol in Revelation chapter 5 that we find identifying Christ. And when we look at the lamb slain in Revelation chapter 5, the lamb slain is a symbol of the cross. From that point on, there are another 28 references of the lamb in the book of Revelation, which is also sanctuary language. Every time there's a reference to the lamb in the revelation, it's a reference to the cross. And I thank God for the cross. For it was on that old rugged cross that the lamb was slain, not for his sins, but for ours. When we make it from the courtyard and we go into the holy place of the sanctuary, we find three articles of furniture there. They were the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the seven branch candlestick. Candlestick. Didn't we talk about that not too long ago? Revelation chapter 1 said Jesus was standing in the midst of the what? The candlestick. Don't go to sleep yet. I'm, I'm going to let y'all go in just a minute. The table of showbread represents the word of God. And it's an interesting point that the table of showbread, on the table of showbread, the showbread was stacked on the table in two groups of six. Six loaves here and six loaves there. And if you just combine six and six, I don't mean add them together, but put them together, you come up with 66. Do you not? How many books are there in the Bible? 66. Do y'all get it? All of these symbols and signs that we find in the Old Testament, especially in the sanctuary, refer to the Bible, God's Word, and especially the book of Revelation. We also find in the holy place the candlestick. The candlestick represents, as we found in Revelation 1, verse 20, the candlestick represents the seven churches. And seven, what does the number seven represent? Complete, complete. The seven churches represent all phases of the Christian church. Seven. Then, of course, we find the altar of incense, which represents the prayers of the people ascending unto God. And then from the holy place, you go into the most holy place. And there you find the Day of Atonement, when the sins of the people are transferred to its rightful owner. Who is the rightful owner of sin? Satan. Transferred to Satan, and then that scapegoat is led out into the wilderness. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they deal with the sacrifice of Christ. That's your altar of sacrifice. The Lava, Pentecost, and the book of Acts, and from Acts all the way down to Hebrews. It tells us of how we ought to be purified. And when you get to Revelation, you have the candlesticks, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, which takes us into the holy place. Revelation 11 brings us into the most holy place. And from there, and from the most holy place, and there on, down to the end of the book, we find ourselves in the most holy place where the sins are being transferred to his rightful owner. Now, how does this become a love story? God 
so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and but have everlasting life it's all about love god went through all this pain to let us know what was coming because he loves us it's like any good parent any good father any good mother we try to tell our children what's ahead and, and how you can avoid the pitfalls of life but it's up to us to listen we can say, oh, no, I'm scared of that. I don't want to know that. I was talking to one of our members yesterday. <laughs> talking to one of our members yesterday, and uh, uh, he was asking how things going and all. I said, things are going well. He, he said, you're still doing the prophecy seminar? Yeah, man, I'm still doing it, still doing it, still doing it. I'm scared of that. Now, this is somebody that listens to and has taught truth every day that they come. It's not just folk on the outside, but some of us right here are afraid of that book. I ain't going to miss my blessing because it's a love story and, and, and the bride is coming. The bridegroom is coming for his bride. I want to be ready when he comes. What about you? Do you want to be ready? Well, if you want to be ready, wake up. Wake up, baby sister. Wake up, everybody. Let's read this book. Let's study this book together. And let, let's let God reveal to us its deeper meaning so that we can be ready when Jesus comes. As we stand to our feet, getting ready to go home, we say thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for us. Lord, this whole book is about how you love us, how you love your bride, and how you are saving us from the dragon. Jesus, I want to be saved. I don't want the devil to have dominion over me. I'm willing to read this book, digest it, Lord, let it become a part of me so that I can be, receive your triple blessing so that I could be one of those that make it into your kingdom. I thank you, Lord, for this word. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless us as we continue to study this book in the blessed name of Jesus, a love story. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Amen. Amen. If you don't thank him for nothing else, just thank him that I finally got through.